Asbury University. Well, first, thank you so much for having me here. A particular thanks go to the Disability Studies Initiative here at Emory, um, but also to all of the wide variety of stakeholders I know are necessary to put together uh, an event of this nature. Um, I want to begin in sort of a curious place, if I may. Um, if you were a moviegoer in 1917, there was a very significant chance that you went and saw The Black Stork, entitled A Vivid Pictorial Drama About Why Dr. Harry J. Hazelton Refuses to Operate to Save the Lives of Defective Newborns. The Black Stork was um, a reasonably popular film at the time, and it was a propaganda piece for the eugenics movement. What may, uh, many, but not all, moviegoers may have been aware of with regards to The Black Stork was that it was roughly based on a true incident. Dr. Harry J. Hazelton was a real Chicago physician who, about a year or so prior to the release of the film, um, delivered a child who was born with significant disabilities um, and required an operation shortly after birth to save the child's life. Um, and acting against the wish of the mother, um, Dr. Hazelton refused to perform the operation, believing that such children should not be allowed to live. Not only did he believe this, but he believed it with such strength and conviction and believed so much that other doctors should follow his example that he called the newspapers to try and make an issue of this and to really try and send the message that the medical profession writ large should not be acting to save such children. Dr. Harry Hazelton played himself in the film, um, and the film is, it's, it's a fairly uh, dark period in American history, you know, when you read a little bit about what actually happens in it, because it basically, it consists, it opens with Dr. Hazelton, you know, walking across the screen, and you know, you can sort of see through a window um, into a child's bedroom and there's a child with um, some obvious physical disability inside the room kind of looking out the window forlornly wishing they could go outside and play um, and Hazelton says to the camera well something's clearly wrong here but the child isn't to blame and then he goes on to explain the basic spiel of the eugenics movement that um, our nation should be aiming to breed better human beings um, in much the same way that one might try to breed better horses or better dogs. Um, and then we see a flashback to an early, earlier period in this child's life, and this is where the movie begins to take its cue from real life events because um, the child is born to um, his mother, and he has some obvious disability, and there are two doctors which um, start talking to the mother. One is Harry Hazelton, who says, he's presented as the hero, well, you really should just let this child die. It's the best thing for the child. It's the best thing for society. And the other is presented as this spectacularly arrogant figure. I can save your child's life. You should let me save your child's life because it will feed my glory and so on and such forth. And the, the mother is about to go with the, the arrogant, and the movie would have us believe, ill-advised second doctor when all of a sudden she has a vision of the future in which this child, oh, so sickly, so pathetic, so weak, um, you know, he, he doesn't that really have any prospects in life. He's utterly worthless. The movie shows us he's utterly worthless because he can't even join the military. Not even Uncle Sam will take him. This is, you know, the ultimate sign that this child's life is not worth living. Um, and, and finally, he grows to adulthood. And so he goes to the store and he buys a gun. And he tracks down the doctor that operated to save his life and he shouts at him, why did you suffer me to live? And he shoots the doctor. And all of a sudden, you know, the mother's vision, you know, ends and she realizes, of course, she should let Dr. Hazelton kill her child through neglect. And there's this kind of vision of the, the child's soul flying into the arms of sort of a spectral Jesus-like figure before the film ends followed by kind of a brief editorial in support of the passage of um, 
national eugenics laws regarding involuntary sterilization and restrictions on marriage. So <laughs> I bring up the black stork, not just because it's, it's a very vivid description of a very dark period in American history, but because I believe that the only way in which you can properly understand many of the debates which occur within the disability community today and that really define large parts of disability politics today is by looking at disability, particularly intellectual and developmental disabilities, although not exclusively, within that historical perspective. And that historical perspective, um, at least one take on it, starts with the eugenics movement in the early part of the 20th century, which as many of you are familiar with, did a heck of a lot more other than make you know, various agitprop uh, cinema. Um, eugenics was responsible for the involuntary sterilization of tens of thousands of Americans. Um, many of you are familiar with the Supreme Court's Buck v. Bell case, which ruled that such sterilization was entirely legal. Just for a Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes stating that three generations of morons is sufficient and the state has an interest in eliminating such parts of the population. Um, but what is less recognized in the um, minimal public consciousness today around eugenics is that America's institutional industrial complex really emerged as a result of the eugenics movement. Over the course of the 20th century, the first half of the 20th century, we saw a vast increase in institutionalization of people with disabilities or people who were perceived to have disabilities. Um, and what's interesting about this is that the population that was being institutionalized was largely being institutionalized um, under the very explicit argument that doing so would protect the general public from having to live with these people and from allowing these people to infect the general public either through being a burden on the state or through breeding and creating future burdens on the state. Um, insofar as there was uh, medical classifications which surrounded this, um, they were uh, very much uh, not what we would refer to um, as scientific today. The terms idiot, moron, and imbecile were used at this point in a clinical sense. Um, but very often the classification that was provided was nothing more than just uh, feeble-mindedness. And at one point in the 20th century, three in every thousand Americans was in an institution. Now, who were these three in every thousand Americans? Um, by and large, contrary to the claims that are sometimes put forward that institutions were built um, only for the most severely disabled, as if that somehow makes um, segregation okay, but by and large, contrary to those claims, these were not people with severe disabilities, mainly because in the first half of the 20th century, people with severe disabilities mostly died um, shortly after birth. There was not a large population of people with severe disabilities to be institutionalizing wholesale. What you saw these institutions built to house was really anyone who wasn't socially valued. So if you were an orphan child wandering the streets of Pittsburgh, you might be picked up and taken to the Polk State School which was a few hours outside of Pittsburgh and you know, it was generally considered, well, that we'll have something to do with you there. Um, you, know, you had babies who were left in baskets out in front of the police station or the institutional administrator's office and were sent there. Um, you had even some people in the American eugenics movement calling on their political enemies to be institutionalized in a um, uh, in a address to the conference of the Missouri Medical Association, the uh, newly elected president of the Missouri Medical Association talked about how we could fix all of these social problems if we dealt with uh, 
um, these undesirable populations through a program of eugenics. We could reduce prostitution such and such percent. We could reduce crime such and such percent. We can even get rid of these IWW folks who were you know, a labor union at the time. We refer to them today as the Wobblies. They were considered a target of eugenics as well. And I think it's interesting to think about that because today, um, many disability rights advocates talk about the social model of disability, which I think most people here are familiar with, but just very briefly, it basically says that disability and the challenges posed by disability are the result of um, society and society's interactions with the characteristics that people with disabilities have. What you would, might be able to say, what you might say is that the eugenics movement had the reverse of the social model, namely that society's problems, all of them in the eyes of some eugenicists, really could be tracked down to the idea that there were these unfit people and if we find some way to segregate and remove these people from the gene pool, we can fix a wide array of different social problems. Um, Let's move forward a little bit from 1917, and uh, I want to go to 1942. Uh, and, and 1942 is an interesting year, in part because it's a point in time in which um, the um, American Psychiatric Association, in its main journal, publishes a dialogue between two people, one, a Baltimore physician by the name of Leo Connor, and Leo Connor is going to be very important. We're going to be talking about him a little bit more later. Um, and the other, uh, uh, by a neurologist by the name of Foster Kennedy. And the focus of this debate is whether or not America should adopt a policy of euthanasia towards severely disabled children and adults. Foster to Kennedy argues the affirmative. Leo Connor argues the negative. And of course, Foster Kennedy's rhetorical techniques are, are not that dissimilar from what we see in um, many discussions in the disability community today. He starts by saying, look, it's important to acknowledge that there are many people who are really only mildly disabled. This, this doesn't really apply to them. We're really only talking about people who have such severe disabilities that they're never really going to be able to contribute anything to society. And so it's really just sentimentality that um, lets us keep them around. We should adopt a rational, scientific approach and institute a policy of euthanasia towards such populations. Um, Leo Connor is horrified being a... Um, refugee from 1930s Vienna, you know, he sees in this something that is, is very much at a very primal, visceral level he knows is wrong and he has some experience with where it leads. So he says, um, should we psychiatrists take our cue from the Nazi Gestapo? And it's a very, it's a very poignant, um, powerful moment. Um, and, and you would think it would be enough to convince virtually anyone, except that at the end of this publication, after Foster Kennedy has his word and Leo Connor has his, the journal publishes an unsigned editorial, meaning it, it potentially implies the opinions of the editors, basically arguing that Connor, well, well-intentioned, is really just being sentimental about this, and we should go with Kennedy, and the United States needs to um, back enabling legislation to allow this to happen. And the reason why what we would be doing if we pursued this policy is different from Nazi Germany is we'd be doing it really strictly within the bounds of rules of law, rule of law, and there would be processes and procedures to make sure that it was done properly. Um, and this was considered mainstream medical opinion um, in the mid part of the 20th century. By the way, it's very interesting to note that um, while Connor was arguing against euthanasia, um, he agreed with Kennedy that we probably did have to involuntarily sterilize this population, all things considered. So this is where we stand um, in the beginning of the second half of the 20th century. This is the public view 
of developmental disability, um, and uh, you know that term was actually one that really didn't come until a couple of decades later. So in a lot of ways, it's the public view of disability writ large. Um, and what's, I think, relevant from this point forward is that um, the second half of the 20th century has two histories that are relevant to this conversation. Because here's the point in which the conversation on the politics and the policies and the rhetoric and the research and the science of the autism world and the politics and rhetoric and research and science of the larger developmental and intellectual disability world and the world that was associated what was then, with what was then called mental retardation really diverge in a very significant way and in a way that has a lot of consequences to um, where we are today in our public conversation about autism. Um, Leo Connor, uh, the year after the um, infamous Connor Kennedy debates, um, publishes a paper which at the time is, is considered very much seminal, um, talking about describing this phenomena he's discovered in his research in Baltimore, um, basically identifying uh, what would become to be called autism. Initially, he talked about it as autistic psychopathy or as a variant of schizophrenia, um, and initially Connor's work, he thought this was something that was very rare um, and was not really um, present in much of the population. Um, around the same time that Connor was doing that work, Hans Asperger, um, still in Vienna, was doing work of a very similar kind um, and really articulated um, and published uh, about roughly the same phenomena, except Asperger's work described the autism spectrum more broadly, and Asperger always thought that this represented, um, you know, a, a fairly um, distinct but still reasonably large minority in the population that more correlated to our modern understandings of autism. Asperger's work, however, was not translated to English until the 1980s and didn't really receive much attention, in part because in 1944, German, uh, German was not the world's most popular scientific language, for reasons that should be only too obvious. Um, but after Connor's paper on autism, as we move into the 1950s and the 1960s, the person who defined really more than anything else how the public and how the mainstream um, you know, research field viewed autism was not primarily Leo Connor. It was primarily someone by the name of Dr. Bruno Bettelheim. Um, many of you who have a familiarity with the history of autism will know Bettelheim's name because Bettelheim today is viewed as a very much an infamous figure, in large part because the central component of Bettelheim's hypothesis around what caused autism, which was also the central component of um, how he constructed his approach to services and interventions and what in his mind he considered treatment, was his belief that autism was caused by poor parenting. Bruno Bettelheim popularized something called the refrigerator mother theory, which basically said, well, autistic children are withdrawn and do not communicate in part because they sense their mother's innate frigidity towards them and this causes them to withdraw within themselves and autism is primarily psychiatric in nature and it's really the result of bad mothers. Um, and you know, to prove this, Bettelheim pointed to all kinds of things like the fact that he had observed that um, many parents of autistic children um, that he had interacted with seemed reluctant to hug their child. Now, of course, today, I think we would 
quite reasonably understand that that's in part because autism comes with a certain degree of sensory hypersensitivity and many of us find, not all, but many of us find hugs, particularly unexpected hugs, to be very overwhelming and unpleasant. And so what we were actually seeing is those mothers having a better understanding of their children than Bettelheim did. Um, and in part because of that, um, Bettelheim branded them as the real culprits in conversations about autism. Um, Bettelheim had a wide variety of views as to how you were supposed to recover um, autistic children from the uh, results of their mother's poor parenting. Many of them are regrettably still common, um, primarily in France and Francophonic countries and certain parts of the developing world. But by and large, um, we've seen the refrigerator mother uh, theory pretty heavily discredited today. But what it did is it left the autism world with um, a very momentous and important split because it basically said to parents of autistic children, um, the advocacy that you should be focusing on is very different from the advocacy that's being focused on in what was then called the mental retardation community. It's very different from the advocacy that you should be focusing on in um, you know, the community of people with um, physical disabilities or cerebral palsy or spina bifida or muscular dystrophy or what have you. Um, you need to be focusing on advocacy around what causes autism because at the moment you're considered what's to blame. And the two major legacies, let's say the three major legacies of the Bettelheim era that are still with us today are that A, the autism advocacy movement at its earliest period developed separate from the broader, what would become developmental disability advocacy movement. Number two, the focus of autism parent advocacy was on what causes autism rather than on trying to um, focus on services or supports or enhancements in quality of life. And number three, there was a view in part rooted in Bettelheim's early view of autism as something that was psychiatric in nature, that autism was something that was induced and that you had a normal child and then something happened and then an autistic child resulted as a result of that something and that presumably if you found the right treatment or medicine or what have you you could reverse the process. Um, so let's look at the non-autism world for a moment as this is going on. By the way we have till six correct? Well that's including Okay. Yeah, that's sure. Let's look at what's going on in the rest of the autism world as this is happening. Um, in the 1960s, President Kennedy, uh, in the early 1960s, President Kennedy comes to office, and in part because of a family connection to what was then called mental retardation, he makes that a major priority um, if for his administration. Um, what would later become called the Developmental Disabilities Act is passed in the early years of his administration. He allocates funding for service provision, still primarily within an institutional model. He creates the National Institute for Child and Human Development. Initially, there's a heavy focus on causation of mental retardation, but that starts to change relatively quickly. And all of a sudden, advocates in the mental retardation community are very excited because they've got the president on their side, and they can move federal policy in a very big way. And then all of a sudden, he goes to Dallas, and he's shot. And all of a sudden, they don't. Um, and obviously the country is in a tremendous amount of mourning during this time and it's sad for everybody but it's particularly sad and particularly aggravating for the mental retardation advocacy community because Lyndon Johnson isn't really interested in these issues to a significant degree. 
um, uh, in the way that President Kennedy was. And so there was a very considerable degree of interest in what can we do to regain momentum? What can we do to move forward the conversation? Um, and what we saw was the emergence of a political coalition. Advocates in the mental retardation community went to advocates in the cerebral palsy community, the muscular dystrophy community, the Down syndrome community, um, and a wide variety of other parts of the community of people with disabilities that were present from birth and basically proposed to create a coalition and said, we will include you in the legislation that Pre President Kennedy passed about us. Um, we'll move from um, a definition of service provision that just focuses on um, that label of what was then called mental retardation and what is now called intellectual disability to one that focuses more broadly on disabilities that reach certain functional impairments and are present from childhood. But in exchange, we want to see the emergence of a broad advocacy coalition. Um, and when you have a broad advocacy coalition, you pretty much have to focus on services and supports, education, quality of life, and a wide variety of other things that today would be very familiar to disability rights advocates. It's very hard to say we want the emphasis to be finding the cause of cerebral palsy or finding the cause of intellectual disability when most of your advocacy work is working in a coalition with a wide variety of other advocates. And so in the developmental disability community, you saw advocates focusing on more bread and butter issues. In 1973, in part through collaborations with the independent living movement and the physical disability community, the Rehabilitation Act was passed. In 1975, the Education for All Handicapped Children's Act was passed, in part because of strategic litigation brought by the developmental disability community um, leading to the establishment of a right to a free and appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment. And you really start to see the emergence of this idea in developmental disability advocacy that the focus should be not on the causes but instead on understanding how we can make people's lives better. In the autism world, something very different is going on. Um, in the 1960s, O. Ivar Lovas had two major research projects at UCLA. One was called the UCLA Feminine Boys Project. And the UCLA Feminine Boys Project was Lovas's attempt to try and recover children he deemed to be at risk of homosexuality. Um, in large part through the use of behavioral intervention. Um, and he believed that through this behavioral intervention, he could make these children essentially appear normal. Now today, that project is highly stigmatized, and rightfully so. Many of Lovas's patients would eventually commit suicide, um, and the entire premise was really a very questionable one. But Lovas's other project, uh, the UCLA Autism Project, was really predicated on a very similar approach. The idea that through behavioral intervention, he could recover autistic children and make them, and I quote, indistinguishable from their peers. And Lovas's approach, while not predicated on the idea that autism was caused by poor parenting, had a very significant commonality with Bettelheim's approach in that his idea of the goal of autism intervention was to take the autistic child and make them appear as non-autistic as possible. Um, Lovas, in order to do that, was willing to um, utilize aversives, the use of pain as a means of behavior modification, and a wide variety of other techniques that we today, I think, would recognize is very unethical, but um, are still uh, present to a disturbing degree within the scope of autism interventions. The other person who starts to play a very significant role in the autism world at this time of separation from the larger developmental disability world is somebody by the name of Bernie Rimland. And Rimland, um, his, his rightful and justifiable claim to fame was he was one of the main people 
who served to disprove the refrigerator mother theory um, in the context of autism. Um, what Rimlin did after that is a source of, uh, I would say, much more damage because um, Rimlin began to make common cause and really work to encourage a group uh, in the groups in the parent community that believed that autism was the result of vaccines. Um, and some of you are familiar that this is a movement that's still present to a disturbing degree today in certain parts of the autism world. Um, um, and Rimlin's approach was not only focused on pushing this discredited idea around causation, but was also focused around the idea that um, if you believe that autism is actually heavy metal uh, poisoning caused by vaccination, there are all kinds of treatment modalities that would emerge as a result of that. And uh, Rimland's Autism Research Institute promoted and still promotes uh, a number of pseudoscientific interventions ranging from chelation to the use of industrial solvent as an autism therapy to the use of um, any number of other things. And we've seen the emergence of a uh, quack industry around autism interventions which preaches everything from uh, Lupron, the chemical used to chemically castrate sex offenders to a wide variety of other disturbing things as autism cures. Um, and what we see, you know, again here is that this is um, a view of the autism world that has its roots. This is a, a kind of a, a situation in the autism world that has its roots in Bettelheim because the parent community initially, quite understandably, saw its focus as being um, around autism causation um, and having been accused of being the source of autism, they then turned around and felt, well, you know, uh, I think we're inclined to be sympathetic to uh, understanding of autism causation that says that the medical community is the source. And this is part of why we see the vaccination hypothesis gain so much credibility in certain parts of the autism parent community, despite the fact of any real support or evidence in the research literature for it. Um, during this time, there's really a, an interesting process of self-selection, because um, I, I talk about the parent community as if it's a monolithic entity, and it really isn't. But um, parents who were interested in a focus on services and supports for their children would disproportionately go into broader developmental disability organizations as the focus for their advocacy. Um, parents that were interested in focusing on causation would go into autism specific organizations. And that's kind of understandable. Those were, you know, the basic distribution of what kind of work those organizations were doing. But it meant that the worse the situation got in the autism world, the less likely you were going to see a correction occur among the people who were primarily in control of autism advocacy at the time, the parent movement. Because if you were concerned about the idea that all of the focus in autism advocacy and all of the focus in autism research is on this idea of causation and is on often questionable or abusive interventions, then you're probably not going to join an organization that preaches those things. And so those organizations are going to be more and more made up of people who um, have views that are aligned with these things that are largely toxic to autistic people um, and our families in the long term. Um, you really start to see a correction occur only in the 1990s, and that's because of the rise of the self-advocacy movement in the autism world. Um, around the 1990s, you begin to see for the first time autistic people who um, either have grown up knowing that they're autistic um, or who are diagnosed autistic in adulthood, typically at the time in early adulthood, 
um, and now are going to autism organization conferences and autism events looking to connect with other autistic people. Um, and some of that was occurring. There was, you know, very frequently kind of small gatherings of autistic people on the sidelines of autism conferences. Um, but there was also kind of a realization that what was being said about us was not really how we viewed ourselves or how we wanted to be represented to the public. Um, in the early 90s, Jim Sinclair, who many people talk about as the founder of the neurodiversity movement, um, wrote an essay which was intended as an open letter to parents. Jim Sinclair was an autistic person. He had been attending autism conferences. Sometimes he'd been speaking at autism conferences. Um, and, you know, he was frustrated by the fact that, and this is common in large parts of the disability community, um, people were very interested in asking him very personal questions about his life, but they weren't very interested in asking him what he thought autism advocacy priorities should be about. Um, Jim Sinclair coined the phrase self-narrating zoo exhibit for the role that um, self-advocates were expected to play at autism conferences. And it's, it's a role I think a lot of disabled people at um, non uh, consumer self-advocate controlled conferences would find very familiar. Um, so he wrote this open letter uh, to the parent community which was intended as a communication of what um, Jim Sinclair's views were in the political and the larger cultural sense for the autism world, not just his, him talking about his personal experiences, in fact, not him talking about his personal experiences at all, but instead really an articulation of where Jim Sinclair felt that the parent movement had gone wrong. Um, and the letter is called Don't Mourn For Us, and it includes a lot of interesting language, but the most important is when Jim wrote that when you say, I wish my child did not have autism, what you are actually saying, intentionally or not, is I wish I did not have the child that I had and had a different child in um, that child's place. Uh, and that's very much a sea change from the Bettelheim model of thinking, which looks at autism and the person that experiences autism as two separate things. What Jim Sinclair very rightly pointed out and what became the basis for this new model of autism advocacy run by and for autistic people was that if autism is something that as we believe and an increasing amount of scientific evidence shows is present from birth, um, it is part of us, it is pervasive, and it colors every aspect of how we experience the world. Um, and so if you say, I want to cure um, or fix or make non-autistic an autistic child, what you're actually saying is, I want to make this child something fundamentally different from what they currently are, um, and I'm really aiming to replace that child with the child that I wish that I had. You notice that neither I nor Jim Sinclair use the traditional person first formulation in our conversations about autism. And that's largely because um, a growing amount of self-advocates in the autism world don't really think of ourselves as people with autism any more than we think of ourselves as people with American citizenship or people with um, maleness or people with, um, you know, I, I don't know, Judaism or any number of other things. But instead, view being autistic as part and parcel of our identity um, and something that's inseparable from us. Um, and this idea, which came to be known by the word neurodiversity, short for neurological diversity, became a very important part of the counter-movement in the autism world to try and take 
the autism conversation somewhere very different from where it had been before. Um, if you talk to uh, a growing number of both self-advocates and parents um, today, there is a significant criticism of many of the dominant organizations in the autism world because of the fact that the majority of research and investment and attention focused on autism has really prioritized causation at the expense of quality of life. Of the $217 million that the National Institutes for Health spent on autism research in 2011, approximately one and a half percent was spent on research on the needs of autistic adults and slightly less than two and a half percent was spent on research focusing on improving the quality of services to autistic people and our families. Um, you see more and more in conversations around autism um, a recognition that um, the idea of what the public's goals surrounding autism should be are very much disputed within the autism community. And that dispute is often presented as being driven um, between parents and self-advocates. Um, what we're seeing more and more of now is uh, parents are starting to break with some of the more powerful autism groups and at least better funded autism groups out there and make common cause with the self-advocacy movement to begin to shift the conversation on autism to be one that focuses more on services and supports and more on quality of life. Um, the neurodiversity movement has a number of practical implications, one of which is that we want to be moving the kinds of service provision that we provide to look at services, um, A, in a more integrated setting, because the idea is not to look at autism services as primarily medical in nature or that they should be taking place within a hospital type environment, but as really part and parcel of how we live our lives as autistic people. And this is very much consistent with the broader disability rights movement's philosophy. Um, but also that we need to be moving away from the idea of the goal of autism interventions as making autistic children and adults indistinguishable from our peers. We need to be removing that idea from LOVAS, from autism service provision, and instead focusing on services and supports that are oriented around maximizing people's quality of life, are oriented around giving people access to the things that they hope for. Um, and that has implications not just in the context of research or in the context of service provision, but also within the context of advocacy as well. Um, one of the criticisms that many self-advocates make of organizations like Autism Speaks, which is the largest and best funded autism organization out there, is A, that very little of their money goes towards um, services for autistic people. Only four cents on every dollar donated to Autism Speaks comes back in the form of um, investments and services in that community. Um, or nationally for that matter, B, that there is not representation of autistic people ourselves in Autism Speaks leadership structure in any meaningful way, but also C, that the way autism is talked about in Autism Speaks' advertisements really, again, speak to the idea of autism as some external tragedy that comes and takes a previously normal child and places an, uh, places an autistic child in their place and that the goal of autism advocacy is to try and correct this tragedy. Um, uh, to give you a couple of examples of what I'm talking about here, uh, a number of years ago Autism Speaks released a uh, fundraising video in which they had one of their senior executives talking about how she had seriously considered taking her autistic daughter, putting in her in the car, and driving off the George Washington Bridge. Um, but she didn't, 
because she also had a normal child as well and had to somehow persevere on for the sake of the normal child. And this is a regrettably common formulation in large parts of the autism advocacy world and where we're seeing it play out currently is in arguments between self-advocates and many parents and certain other parents um, in the aftermath of incidents in which parents do kill their children. Um, and you know the point that we've been trying to make is very often the way the media talks about um, instances in which parents kill their ch autistic children or children with any other disability um, is uh, they try and present it and certain parts of the parent community try and present it as a story primarily around services or lack of services um, whereas we would view it really as about a ideology that's very common in certain parts of our culture that preaches that it's better to be dead than it is to be disabled. Um, and that the, the deaths of disabled people aren't the tragedy, but that our lives in fact are. Um, and so the neurodiversity movement and the self-advocacy movement are really designed to respond to this and are designed to correct this, but also designed to put forward a vision of what it means to be autistic and what it means to engage in advocacy around autism that is also proactive as well as reactive. And in a variety of places in which autistic people have gathered together, we've seen the emergence of an autistic culture um, that has had a profound impact on how we live our lives and has had a profound impact on how we view ourselves. Some of that impact comes in the form of access. Uh, Rosemary and I were talking, Rosemarie? Yes, okay, thank you. Was to, or, and I were talking earlier today um, about uh, the need to incorporate access needs um, for autistic people and other people with disabilities that impact social communication in various events and conferences put on by the Disability Studies Initiative. Well, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about there. Um, out of some of the um, larger gatherings of autistic people in conferences run by and for us, we saw the emergence of something called the communication color badge system. Um, and what that basically is, is if somebody doesn't want to talk to people at the moment, if they feel overwhelmed, if they feel like they can't really um, communicate with anyone and they don't want to be approached, they wear a red badge and it also says red for those who are colorblind. Um, if somebody does want to talk to people they already know, but they don't really feel comfortable talking to new people, they wear a yellow badge, it also says yellow. And if somebody wants to talk to someone um, or wants to meet new people, but they don't really feel comfortable making that approach, um, they wear a green color badge, and that really sends the message that I want you to come up to me and introduce yourself, and I want to have a conversation with you, even if I'm not approaching you. Um, this is kind of a vision of access is very different from what many people think about in conversations about disability access, because it's one that really speaks to types of disabilities and types of interactions with society that aren't the same as ones in which we talk about physical architecture um, or um, the architecture of technology or other similar things, but really speak to the social architecture of our society. And there are a lot of other similar examples. And one of the areas of value and proactive um, visions of the neurodiversity movement is to take these things that developed within the autistic culture and to try and bring them into the broader culture, both as a way of making the broader culture more accessible for us, but also as a way of trying to um, ensure that the broader population can benefit from a universal design perspective from these things as well. How many of you think that a communication color badge system would be really useful during uh, college orientation? or really even during the rest of the campus, eh, during the rest of the year. I mean, you know, to be perfectly honest, I think there are a lot of people with or without, um, you know, a, an autistic neurology who would benefit from being able to put on a green, yellow, or red badge 
every so often and having the population writ large understands what, understand what that means. Um, how would our society benefit if we started to recognize that traditional forms of body language, like making eye contact um, or not rocking back and forth, didn't necessarily correlate to the ideals of somebody being more trustworthy or more competent or more fill in the blank that uh, many people presume that they do. And so I think autistic culture and neurodiversity's efforts to bring the ideas of autistic culture into the mainstream um, have a benefit that goes beyond just making the world more accessible for autistic people. Um, but that also speaks to the idea of the value that autistic culture and really in other manifestations, disability culture writ large can bring to the world as a whole. And I think that's a really interesting and worthwhile note to end on or at least to shift the questions on because it kind of takes us full circle from where we started back in 1917 in the throes of the eugenics movement in which the problems of the world are defined as all emerging because of the existence of people with disabilities. If our vision of the world can change, if we can start asking the question, how can we look to what the community of people with disabilities can offer society writ large? And also, how do we look at a vision of um, worth and dignity that um, really recognizes all people as being equal, regardless of what they have to contribute? Um, you know, that in and of itself really serves as a very valuable legacy that the disability rights movement and all of its various offshoots, the self-advocacy and the neurodiversity movement can leave in its wake as it continues to work to change the world to be more accessible for people with disabilities of all kinds. And so I think that the way that we want to see the disability rights conversation evolve um, is to move to a conversation that recognizes that disabled people face systemic, systemic barriers um, and systemic exclusion and that works to address that, but it also recognizes that there is a proactive disability identity and a proactive disability culture and a proactive message and that that is something that has a great deal to offer the world. I want to thank you all very much for your time, and I think we now have a good 40 minutes for questions. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.